the reason I came up with this topic is a lot of people, there's just so much involved in the game. There's so many different uh, gizmos and gadgets and techniques and, you know, it's kind of, a lot of people have questions about how you put votes up, what real do I buy? Uh, so that's kind of what fueled the motivation for this topic. If you guys at home have questions, please fire away. Um, definitely a little bit of a throw together. I was been out all day, so this is, this is what we got. Um, what we are going to do is uh, we are going to review uh, just some basics, uh, planer board basics, rods, reels. Uh, we'll go over some different pieces of equipment you guys need. And uh, just really just keep it kind of general. So if you guys have anything specific that, you know, is, is your particular thing. Fish finders. Fish, fish finders. Okay. Yeah. Electronics can be uh, definitely very helpful or frustrating, as we all know. Um, we have multiple units for different reasons. You know, I always have, I'm always, we run autopilot, so we're on the back of the transom. Uh, running everything pretty much ourselves. We don't run mates. So um, I'll have a unit back there and I'll have a unit on the dash for when I'm driving. Uh, you got your fish hawk, of course. I've been running my Panoptics transducer a lot more lately, um, which I'll talk about a little bit, but are, do you guys, you guys have that or familiar with it? It's pretty neat. It's basically real time. Um, it's, it depicts an image of directly as you would see your spread from underneath your boat. So you can see your downrigger weights, you can watch them fall, you can watch fish interact with your spread, um, depending on how far your lures are back. And I'm, I'm still pretty new with it, but uh, it is pretty cool. Um, what I can say about it is uh, I, I don't necessarily feel that it's like something you just got to go get because you're going to catch a bunch more fish. I think it helps you learn a little bit more about the enthusiasm levels of the fish, you know, you'll see them on a really good bite day. You'll see, boo, they come in and bang, they'll hit. And other days they'll come in slowly. The, you know, they might, they might go to one weight, the other one, and then they'll go to the third one and then they'll just kind of leave. And you'll see that happen two or three times in a row before maybe you catch a fish. So it's, it's cool. Uh, in that regards, I, I don't think it's, anything that you're going to catch twice as many fish because you have it. I think it's a great tool. Um, so anyway, that's how we set up our electronics. A lot of times, the biggest thing I've learned is uh, if you're getting a lot of interference or your transducers angled wrong or it's in the wrong position or it's in the wrong part of your boat, if you're getting a lot of interference, that's most likely why. And uh, I tend to like to run mine a little bit at more of an angle. And I think it just, it shoots it away from the boat a little bit better. And when you're running, you know, I can actually go between 10 and 15 knots and I can scan a whole area and see if there's fish there or not without any interference. So that's all stuff that you can tweak. Um, a lot of morning, a lot of days when I'm running around looking for lakes, lake, I'll, I'll just drive for a half a mile or so until I see what I want to see before I set up. Yeah, almost. You know, I'll see bait, I'll see, I'll see pods of bait on bottom and I'll see, you know, little specks that I know are fish. So the more you intimately get to know your, your electronics, the better. It's just time using them. And what a 787, uh, and I remember this because it was a little bit easier. Mm-hmm. Uh, from uh, him, uh, 17 years ago. Hmm. And so I'm in the thing, throw the plug in chip for different lakes. Yeah. Pick up the chip for the lake shore. Yep. You can see the time. I traded in that boat seven years ago and I just left that on there. Yeah, I'm never very good with it anyway, so I'm not going to do it. Yeah. That's all right. They can't hear you very good on there anyway. Um, yeah, there, it's, there's just the amount of technology you can buy now is amazing, you know, yeah. for the buck, for the buck that you spend. One came with the boat, the concrete boat, is a uh, inexpensive hummingbird, and it just, you know, depth finder and the little books come up and only like a traditional. 
Yeah, uh, it's y'all getting used to it, uh, yeah. adjusting your sensitivity levels. I never leave my fish, the little fish icons. When people tell, when I get on somebody's boat and they have those little fish icons on their screen, you know, because obviously there's a ton of interference most of the time, especially when you get surface clutter and stuff and everybody thinks they're marking a million fish and they're not catching them. Um, you'll also get a lot of uh, the thermocline as it develops your fish finder is going to start to re read those different densities of water as a structure. So you're going to get like a, what you think is all this bait. It's not, it's most likely just a different water thing going on density wise. So there's all little things like that. So you run um, the shock in your no, uh, not on Lake George. Um, fish hawk, you know, the, the guys that are really running that, day in and day out or like your Lake Ontario guys, you know, maybe Champlain where, I mean, there might be in like a three or four mile an hour current that's going on and they're, you know, they might be only going a mile an hour, but there's, there's a three mile an hour current underneath. So the fish hawk, if you really watch it, it never really, it's not giving you an exact speed. It's basically giving you a reference, you know, so it's, it's always kind of jockeying around you know, then it's somewhat of an accurate number, but you know, normally like if my speed over ground is 2.5, my fish hawk generally isn't, isn't going to be that accurate on the surface. It's just kind of, it's going to be close, but it's going to give you that reference. So, okay, if you're, you know, a mile and a half or more current going on somewhere, something crazy like that, it's going to help you, yeah, you know, and the temperature of, of course is huge. It's temperature is very accurate on those. Um, but your speed, you know, you got to kind of get used to using it. Um, as you're moving your downrigger weight around and changing depths, it'll kind of, it takes a little while for it to really settle into a certain groove, you know. But um, on Lake George, we don't have a ton of current. Um, not really enough to, some days there there is, but I mean, nothing like Ontario where you have like really serious current out there, you know. Um, the fish hawk, though, is definitely a game changer. You, you got to have one on your boat if you're going to be, especially looking for, you know, very specific temperature oriented fish like salmon. Different trout, trout species and salmon, you're looking for a certain temperature, you're looking for temperature breaks and stuff like that. Um, and again, on Lake Ontario, I mean, they could have a thermal climb one day and it's 70 feet down and then the next day it's ruptured. It's crazy what happens out there. Not so much on our smaller lakes. It pretty much sets up where it is. So I'm not going to just leave it running all day. You know what I mean? I just use it for a reference. Yep. Um, so that's the electronics. Uh, so basically, uh, trolling, boat setup is key. Um, a lot of things. What kind of downriggers do I buy? What kind of rod holders? All that stuff. Um, is personal preference but important and, and depending on what you do a lot of um for us we like the scotties just because they're simple they don't break um they only draw power on the way up manual down we really like those they just they're just bulletproof they just run and run and run uh a lot of the guys on ontario they're a big fan of the canon optimums because it, it communicates with their fish hawk and you know they have a lot more technical things they like to do with them. Um, but a lot of the downrigger stuff is just personal preference. I can tell you, like anything else, the more, the fancier the equipment, the more, more likely it's going to be, you're going to have problems with it that arise. You know, you can ask Jeff, <laughs> I mean, he's the biggest repair shop and just that the cannons break 10 to one to the Scotties. That's just a fact. So. Oh, Something years ago, bigger stuff stuff break. Big and the big johns too are bulletproof yeah. you know but again oh, they are um and that's just what we like and use you know there's probably guys out there listening to this that think cannons are the best thing and they are they're cool it's just a lot of it's a lot of technology that you probably don't need you know the average person but um braid versus cable that's another debate uh braided downrigger line versus the cable um i like both i have i've kind of gone away from the 
uh, braid only because I've just had it break too many times on me. Um, cable's a little more forgiving, I think, with the Scotties because they're they're automatic up and they're really high speed. So, for example, um, if I have like a stacker clip on there or something, and I forget it. You know, ping. I've lost downrigger weights like that, or you get you have one of the snap stopper snaps that gets weird on you, and it and it comes up and it goes around the pulley and gets caught. And so I've just kind of gotten away from the braid personally. Um, it cuts through the water better. A lot of the Ontario guys they love it because you know they're fishing sometimes two hundred feet of water or deeper, and if they don't get that blowback that you get with cable. So uh, we're never fishing that deep, you know. Um, and then there's also the the cable hum. Some guys love it, say it attracts a fish. Other guys say it spooks hum. I, I really don't think it makes any difference either way, you know. I've used both. I can't say I've noticed a big difference, you know, one way or the other. Um, so that's the, that's the my take on the cable versus the braid. Downrigger weights, you got pancakes, you got balls, you got banana weights, you got fish weights. Um, again, I like I liked the old uh, true tracks with the metal fin on them that you can bend. That way your wings are always swinging out, kind of. It gives you a little bit wider spread. Um, a lot of guys like those fish weights, the shark weights, I think they're called. Um, Jeff has those. I think they're, the big thing with those is they're really supposed to slice through the water good. Um, I haven't tried them, you know, can't tell you much about that. Balls, we use balls quite a bit uh, just for like basic, you know, fishing bottom or something where you're, you're not really concerned about them swinging outside the boat. Uh, not, not really, you know, there's a lot of crap in the lake. You get hung up a lot doing that. Um, yep. Yeah. Uh, what else we need to talk about downriggers releases, uh, for us blacks, you know, are the way to go again, simple. There's the, um, there's so many, diff I mean, when you get into each topic of all this stuff, there's so many different brands and preferences. And I mean, these are just a couple Sorry, that I grabbed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, these are, this is a good, like King Salmon release, but. You know, part of the segment being informational is like to the average person that may want to fish Lake George, you know, hey, it's a downrigger release. I'm going to use this one. This would be something that's way too big. You know, I would personally never use that. But, you know, again, everything just small and simple, you know, for what we do. But in Lake Ontario, you're, you're going to want this big boy, especially for kings, because um, the, the biggest thing with trolling and downriggers and releases you want the fish you don't want a too light of a release because they're going to just grab the lure and break it all the time break the release off and they're not going to have the hooks you really want i would almost have a release not fire versus just firing all the time and miss half the fish that bite you really want them to be struggling and by the time those hooks are set then the rod goes off that's how everything's designed okay so um that's the idea, really, with all these releases. Great planer board release right here. Um, we'll get into planer boards briefly. So you got uh, basically you have the big boards that are run on a mass system with you know planer board line designed to be um, used with releases of some sort that slide down the line. Uh, I like these Scotties. I like the Amish Outfitter Clippers. Jeff doesn't have any of those here. Those stay on your line, basically. There's different ways you can rig those up. There's videos online you can watch. Um, a lot of the small boat guys like these inlines just because they may not want to run a mass system on the front of their boat. Uh, the bigger boats, like my, my boat, I have the reels right on the side on the hard top. Um, biggest difference in the two systems uh a is versatility you know with big boards i can use different styles of releases on there i can use a lot more line. i can run a lot more lines typically um some guys will run a, a lot of lines with these but it, it gets a little more dicey in my opinion especially if you're turning a lot 
Um, the big boards, uh, definitely versatility, you know, they're just more versatile. These little boards, uh, better for slow trolling. Oftentimes they oftentimes will get you more bites because they're individually, you know, they're surging your baits in the waves and the wind and stuff. Whereas a, a big board system is just kind of pulling them all at the same pace. Um, great walleye board, great brown trout board. Uh, the inlines are, are really, in my opinion, for heavier line applications. You know, you have to clip your line in here and it stays on your, your line until you're ready to take it off to reel the fish in. So you get a hit on these, you see the board go back, you reel the board into the boat and then you got to take it off before you can fight the fish. So you got to have pretty heavy line, right? You're not going to put this thing on six pound test. Uh, that's the biggest disadvantage in my opinion with these. And, uh, you know, we fish landlocks a lot and I, I just don't really care for them for landlocks. So we're usually using really light line in our lake. Um, the guys in Ontario and Champlain, you know, they can get away with it. They're using heavier stuff. Uh, more of a big game board in my opinion. Um, this is a good one. TX 12 church for, uh, <clears throat> basically the bigger, the board, the heavier, the, uh, you know, whatever you're, you're running. So like the size here would be great for like a clean spoon, uh, stick bait in the springtime on the surface. Not, not something that doesn't have a lot of weight to it. Maybe some short lead cores, segmented lead cores or something like that. Um, once you start getting into like really big runs of copper, uh, big runs of lead core, you're going to want to bump up to the next size. Cause it's going to take a lot more drag to pull that. So, How far away do you like your outer boat? Uh, you, you know, you really don't, it depends on how many lines you're running. Of course, if I'm just going to run a couple lines, I really don't let it out that far. So a lot of times, you, you know, people, they think they got to run them way out, you know, so they don't spook the fish, which may be the case some days, but when that fish hits, you know, that outside line, if you got a ton of slinkage in between, you're, you're going to have a little harder time with your hook set. So if you're going to run just a couple lines, you're better having them tight because you want that board to pull hard. That's what's going to be a good hook set because your line's going over and out. Um, so yeah, I don't usually run them any further than maybe 100 feet, 50 feet, something like that. Yeah. And I'm not usually running much out, you know. Um, if you're going to go with the otters, you really need the double. Yeah. So, and another thing with the planer boards, the whole idea with a big board is you want them to pull hard. A lot of the plastic ones, you know, you can get away with running, you know, your shallower stuff, your lighter stuff, stick baits, clean spoons and stuff like that off them. But once you get into heavier things and more lines, they, I, they just don't pull hard enough for me. The fish will almost pull the board back and the line with it. And if, you know, you want something that really pulls hard, that way you're, you're going to get that good hook set on the release. Um, a lot of the guys on Ontario with the big, big boats, they like the Amish outfitter boards, especially during King season, because they just pull incredibly hard. So when that, you know, a King salmon, obviously, especially later in the season when their mouths get all bony and stuff, they're running long, long lines of copper and stuff off them. They really want something that's, you know, when they hit it, it's going to get a good hook set and pull hard. A lot of those boards will pull your boat right over to the side. Those Amish outfitter, you know, if you have a smaller boat. So uh, I think the otter's pretty all around, really good big board for me. You gotta be careful with them though, they're foam. Um, the only thing I don't like about them, occasionally you'll if you bend the keel or somebody steps on them, they crack. I had to put a couple braces on mine because, you know, they're just, they're styrofoam, so. Yeah. Yeah, I had a, had mine cracked last year and I put like some of that metal perforated stripping around it and it's held up pretty well. Um, rods and reels. So again, there's just a lot of different rods for different applications. Uh, this is Jeff's nine foot medium lights, which this, in my opinion, is a pretty good all around downrigger rod, you could run maybe some lead core on it. Um, 
you know, for your smaller lake application, this is one of my favorites. The light action we like a lot for really light line on, on just a clean downrigger spoon program or something like that. It's really light. Um, I'll tell you, it's really hard to find a good downrigger rod, in my opinion. 90% of them, they're just too stiff. They're too heavy and clunky. And, you know, they'll get the job done. But some of the best rods we've ever had, uh, they don't make anymore. And we, they weren't even intended to be downrigger rods. We just used them as that. They were old, like, noodle steelhead rods and stuff. Um, you know, you want something that you're obviously – after you get a fish on, you're pulling it two miles an hour, or however fast you're going. So you want forgiveness. And when you're using light line and you're trying to catch, you know, bigger fish on light line, you, you really want that nice noodley rod. Um, yeah, so Jeff's rods are really, in my opinion, he, he did a pretty good job with them. Um, the light action ones are, were, he had an issue with those, so they'll they're be available next year. But uh, that medium weight, it's really pretty close. Um, reels. Biggest, by far my biggest pet peeve is, is a good reel. You know, and uh, you learn, if you really fish a lot, you're going to learn that you buy cheap reels, like you said. You know, you might save 100 bucks, but you're going to be buying a new one every two years. Versus like these, we run a lot of the older <laughs> Dakotas. Um, I haven't ran these yet, but I, I don't know. I guess they're okay. They look a little, I'm not wild about the profile of them, but I see a lot of guys using them. They must like them. Do you? Um, yeah. But I don't know. I kind of like these. But, uh, you got to buy, if you buy a good, like these Shimano's, I mean, we literally, you want a nice, smooth, smooth drag, and you just want something that's, you know, a lot of times, like, the clicker breaks on them, or the line counters break on them, and they're just, and it's just worth it, you know. Um, so for us, this this would be probably my top pick. The Daiwa Saltis are also really good. Um, the Daiwas really are a great reel for the money, but I find the clickers go on them. That's the only thing I've had wrong with them. You you too, yeah. Um, but the Shimano, they're just Swiss watches. I mean, we have reels that are like 10, 12 years old and haven't been maintained, and they're just all they're unbelievable. You know, uh, I hear good things about those, but uh, I, I personally have never been a Okuma guy. You know, they're just I I have had some Okuma stuff, and I'll be honest with you, the uh, the Magda Pro series that they're cheap, they're just complete junk. The drags, it's either there's two settings, it's too tight or it's way too loose, and you can't reel. Um, the convectors. They're, I think, more of a workhorse. Uh, but for me, I don't. I think the drag's not smooth enough. You know, if you were to put like thirty pound test mono on it for kings, it'd probably be fine because those those things will just rip line out even if it's a little too tight anyway. Uh, but for like your smaller lake applications, they just don't have the smooth drag. You know, the cold waters I think is a pretty decent reel, but uh, again. The, the thing is, is like, if you're going to buy a set of four reels, just spend the extra hundred and get the best reel you can get. It's not like you're buying a, you know, $700 G Loomis rod. That's going to basically do the same thing a $100 rod is going to do. This isn't going to do this. You know, you're, you're saving a couple hundred dollars, but you're getting a far better product in my opinion. So uh, that's kind of the way I look at reels. Um, then there's you know monofilament versus braid and we could talk about that for probably a long time but uh usually mono is what i run for everything uh, yeah or low vis green mono yep fluorocarbon definitely um other means of 
getting down. So you got you got lead core, you got copper, you got mini divers, you got dipsy divers, you got jet divers. I mean, there's so much out there. Um, and again, I it's all about keeping it simple at first. You know, figure your downrigger game out. Um, downriggers, blacks, releases. That's that's about all you need for the riggers, and and it's all about learning how to adjust your release to the right tension. Catch a few fish, and you kind of dial it in with the little screw that's on it. Um, as far as this stuff goes, I mean, you can just play around with this stuff to no end, and they, they're a lot of these uh, devices have. They have a certain purpose for a certain time of year, certain species, a certain application, like these mini divers. Um, diving apparatus in general, so they all have a dive curve. So the biggest thing with this stuff is uh, like this, I think, is a, a two to one diver. So with two feet out, it'll sink a foot roughly. So like this is a great springtime brown trout thing because if the browns are down 10 feet you can let out 20 or 30 feet with your diver it's going to be roughly down that far um what i'll do with these a lot of times for browns is like if i'm if i'm running a lot of flat lines on the surface or maybe some uh rattle and rogue or something that are down five feet run those on the outside and then you can run these really tight on the inside lines so they're they're down but they're you know not back as far as your outside lead so it's all feng shui um, that can be a pretty hot setup for that. But so just really all these things are designed for when you're trying to find that depth, you know, depending on whatever oh, time of year it is, you know, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, little divers are great. Dipsies, of course, you know, different sizes are for different depths that you want to target. Um, I don't, I'm not a big dipsy guy on Lake George. We oftentimes, we just turn too much and it's just, they're just more of, if you're going to run and gun long distances and you can make big looping turns, you know, you can run dipsies all you want. Um, but not a big fan of them on Lake George. Uh, but they're obviously great for Kings, great for Lake Ontario style stuff. They come with a dive chart that tells you how much line to put out, you know, to achieve a certain depth. Um, a lot of the subtleties with a lot of these things is just figuring out how long your leader you're going to run. Um, you know, that's where the devil's in the details with these little clip on the little mini divers, you know, generally you want to run as long of a leader as you can, obviously. So the fish doesn't see it, or sometimes you may want the fish to see it and it's attracting them, you know, all that stuff is just stuff you have to learn to, to tweak over the years. Uh, lead core, of course, uh, especially early in the season. Spring springtime staple. We like the micro lead. You can put it on a smaller reel. Is there actually lead in there? There is. There is. Yep. Okay. Um, <laughs> lead core basically, uh, it's the standard is a, at two miles an hour. It'll dive about five feet per every color change. It changes color every thirty feet. So, and the deadly thing about lead is, uh, you know, you're obviously you're never going exactly the same speed. So if you're going a little slower, it sinks. If you're going a little faster, it fishes higher. So it, it's always kind of hunting and it's, it's always kind of keeping your bait moving like that. Um, good stuff. But micro lead, probably my favorite. And it's tougher than nails. I mean, I have reels that have three year old lead on it and I just, I can't break it. It looks, it's faded. Um, and we always run our lead on line counters. I, I don't even know how many colors I have out half the time. I do it all by count, you know, because sometimes you'll have a, you might not have, maybe you'll have two and a half colors out versus three. That's just the sweet spot where you're getting them. Um, mostly spring, early summer. You know, a lot of times in the midsummer, we're just kind of working bottom. Uh, copper, also a great tool. Copper is basically just a deeper lead core. You know, copper, it's heavier, it, di it digs deeper with less out. So I think uh, like basically a 300 lead that would sink down about 50 feet, you can achieve that same depth with about 200 copper, I believe. So um, I think copper uh, is a 40 foot dive with 200 out. 
So, and that's why they, they love that for the Kings because they can run a five, six, seven hundred copper, even even more. And it's, you know, there's a lot of line out, but it'll get, it'll get down there 70, 80 feet, you know. Um, and you can run copper through a regular eyelet, unlike steel, which you need rollers for. And I mean, I don't get into any of that, but again, for the purpose of discussing trolling. Um, copper, we, we do run, you know, some copper once in a while. Um, I like the 32 pound for the smaller lakes, blood run, 32 pound copper. Um, what else? Snap weights are also a good thing. Um, always keep some one, two, and three ounces around, especially if you're running lead pour and you want to, maybe you have a spliced leads that are three or four color spliced leads in the springtime. You want to get down there another 10 feet, you can throw a one ounce bell sinker on there. Um, the bell weights generally one ounce will get you about 10 feet with a hundred feet out. That's on a 50, 50 count. So 50 feet out, put the snap weight on another 50 feet out. That'll get you down roughly 10 feet. So that's kind of how, if I'm running, you know, six or eight colors or something like that, and I want to get it down another 10 feet, I'll put like a one ounce bell weight on there about halfway, you know, and then you're just letting the fish tell you if you're in the zone or not, you know, you, you might think you are, you can confirm that by catching them, you know? So there's different things we do and, and different ways to get down to the fish. Um, I both those real does it? Yeah. I mean, I got a motor. You have drip bags for it? I, you have the bags for it? I, I tried a bag to try to buy down the bucket store better than anything else. Yeah, the bags will slow you down if you get the right size. Yeah. Uh, Amish outfitters. Yeah. Buggy bags. Beefy, they make a beefy one too. They're, they're the best. Yeah. Uh, Laker speeds. So generally faster when it's colder, slower when it's warmer. Um, but usually two to two and a half, you know, in that range. Sometimes in the summer, a little bit slower. But uh, you can also go real fast and try to trigger reaction bites, you know. More of, uh, early in the season. Give you too much uh, the bells you want to run more like a 180. Yeah. Bells are designed to be fish slower. Um, yeah, speed is, is really an interesting thing. And time of year and fishing pressure, and there's a lot of different things that come into play. You know, all, all of our fish move into certain areas, especially in that south end. Obviously, you, you know, you see everybody starting out fishing the pilot knob trench. And then there'll be fish that move out into the mud and deep water. And, but those fish see a lot of lures, you know. And uh, fish out Yep. Yeah. Never seen a catch Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are at certain times that it's a, a lot of it is the seasonal, you know, there's just seasonal things and there's day to day things that they're really the lake trout are tough to troll in Lake George at certain times of the year. They really are. I even have days where I pull my hair out, you know, and I mean, you can go up to Lake Champlain. They're like freaking crazy zombies, flesh eating zombies up there. You know, it's just it's a. It's just a different ecosystem, and it's it's a delicate ecosystem. I think the um, valley, you know, mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, it's issue there. If there's something dumb enough, if I, I 
one of my presentations there. But yeah. 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 You fish spoons mostly? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like older ones, I got some bigger ones. Yeah. Hmm. I ninety percent of that lake, in my opinion, like day in and day out, there's very specific feeding windows that you'll notice. And like this time of year, I like later in the day personally, especially when the fish are deeper, because uh, <clears throat> when they're in that deep water, especially your more your more mature fish, you know, early in the morning. The first run I make, I'll catch fish, but they're all this big, and it's like they're they're like high school kids. They're they're always just ready to go. And those more mature fish, when it's dark down there, they're not going to expend their energy feeding until it, it gets a little bit lighter. That's at least what I think. And I think there's a lot more. Uh, there's fish that go in shallow early, you know, and they're they're on the fringes, probably eating panfish and stuff like that, and then they'll they'll show up later. So there's two that dynamic going on but uh a lot of it is just being in the right place at the right time and really understanding when you're in a pot of fish that are feeding you know that that's a special thing because you have a lot of suspended fish you have a lot of different fish doing different things and uh, they'll turn on eventually but it's oftentimes only for a certain amount of time i notice that a lot out there anyway you know Tricky. yeah it is well, my day generally is based off the weather. Uh, what I mean by that is wind is going to dictate my program. If it's going to be real windy, those are the days I'll put a ton of crap in the water because, you know, especially if it's cloudy and windy, you know, it's a little darker down there. You can hide a little more stuff. Um, the Lake George fish, they don't like a lot of crap in the water, in my opinion, you know, you don't want cheaters and dipsy divers and all kinds of, it's just, it's so clear. Um, that's not my, my particular style anyway, when it's cloudy and nasty out. Yeah. You might, cause you generally you have a more aggressive bite. You can hide more stuff. Um, but so the weather is going to dictate my program, but if, if it's going to be windy and I'm going to be. Boat control is my biggest issue. I'm probably going to keep it simple. Uh, maybe run, uh, if it's flat, I'm going to probably keep it simple, run cowbells, you know, keep it more streamlined, fish more of a bottom game. If it's windy, I'm going to run spoons. I'm going to work suspended fish. Usually when it's, if it's darker and windy, a lot of the more mature fish are up higher, they're feeding, and you'll see that. Um, you'll see on, on days when it's a tough bite, you'll think there's no fish in the lake. They won't mark them, but they're there. They're just laying in the mud, you know, those can be tough days cause you're not seeing fish. So you're relying on catching them and you will catch them, but you're not going to mark them necessarily because they're, they're not up They're When you see those hooks off, up off bottom, those fish are on the hunt. They're looking, they're feeding, um, Days when you just see those lumps kind of hanging off bottom are the days when it might be a little tougher or the time of day when it's a little tougher, you know? So that's a good question, but that's, it's always weather, weather related. I'm not going to try to fight the wind and, and run a cowbell program if it's going to be 20 mile an hour winds when I want to go a little bit slower. Those are the days I'll put spoons on and go two, two and a half and, you know. Well, I only have two riggers with two five, but there's times like, I might not even see the bite or the rod move. How often are you checking these rods? Um, that's a really good question. In my opinion, uh, changing out is is key. And uh, you know, people will often say trolling is boring. Well, yeah, when you're sitting there watching your rods for hours on end and you're not doing anything, it, it is boring. And the fish probably think it's boring too because they're looking at the same two lures all morning, you know? So change things out. Change, if you're not having success, it's all about changing. Um, and I have days where I, I just can't get them going and I'm pulling my hair out and I'll, I'll stumble on something that they like. And it's like, okay, you know, you figure, you figure it out for that day and, you know. So, it, that's what it's all about is, is changing 
you know. So if I'm changing, if I'm running cowbells, I might be changing the color of the cowbell. I might be going from a, a plug to a spoon. Um, you know, yeah, it, it can be, it can drive you crazy. Uh, now when, now when spoons, <laughs> spoon fishing, and I said this in my last seminar, the best thing I can say is just pick one kind of spoon. You know, like a speedy shiner, Jeff Scott, they catch fish, you know, and just get a bunch of them, learn how to fish them, learn what colors in that, within that, uh, you know, company of brand spoons that they like, and just get a confidence running those. A lot of times I think, uh, especially in this lake, they, they don't like when you mix and match stuff um, because, you know, if I'm a fish and I, you know, say your spread is as wide as this little room you're in, they can get behind that and they can see all three of your lures, you know? So it's, if you're running three of the same style lure, this is just the way my mind works. I could be way wrong on this, but this is how I approach it. They get behind that and they, they see one doing this and then the other one's going like this, you know, because different spoons have different actions. So pick one where at least they're all doing this, a similar thing. And then maybe they're, they're just, they're seeing that one color that looks natural to them when they're feeding that that's what, that's what they're hitting because that's what looks most like what they're feeding on with the conditions present. You know, that's the best way to do it. Uh, I, I wouldn't mix and match stuff, you know, especially early on in, in learning. So I did your cats and for yours. Yeah. Can you mention any of those? Yeah, uh, it's something you got to let the fish tell you what they like, you know, I've had, I have different spoons, like, um, I got some old moose looks that I think I've been too much, you know, it's all stuff you got to play with and you'll see like with the moose looks, if you bend them, you know, your rod tips can go like a Phoebe kind of, sometimes that's too much, you know, so that's all stuff you got to play with. I wouldn't go crazy with that at first, maybe just a little bit, but, um, with most spoons, you know, you're, you're really just the whole caveat with trolling that makes it hard is once you get that lure down there, you know, it's, you're relying on it to catch the fish. So if it's not what they want, it's not changing. It's just doing what it, it does. So you really, you want your spoon to be, doing something different by itself. And a lot of spoons are designed to maybe go back and forth and then at a certain speed, they'll flip every once in a while. That's really what triggers that bite a lot. Cause you'll see they follow, I mean, fish follow for a long time sometimes before they hit something. Um, so that's just all stuff you got to play with. But the whole caveat with the trolling is just, it takes a long time to really sort through all this stuff because you're, you have to let it sit and fish. You can't just recast it and then reel it in a different way. Or you can't just recast it and put a different lure on. Uh, so it's it can be tricky, you know. Um, and it's all just experience and you know developing lures that you're confident in. Um, and I would also, you you guys fish Lake Champlain a lot. Have you ever fished up there? Um, that's a great lake to troll and because you're going to have some success up there. There's just more fish and, you know, it, it's well, different. You Did you? Yep. Yeah. Uh, there's more fish. Oh, yeah. yeah I'd be the first to say. The majority of the fish. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Five or six a week, but you get fifty Lakers. Yeah. You know, so like, uh, the Lakers are they really are tough though. And it's because they settle, they kind of settle into certain areas that get fished a lot. And once they see, you know, what I see a lot is uh after April, um, they'll they'll come off the smell areas and then they'll all settle into one area which is normally around the pilot knob trench. And there's a hot bite there. And the reason for that is that I don't think they've seen a lot of lures. And then as time goes on, they get it, you know, it's all the same fish there. Uh, and it, it's just, that's, it's the same thing with ice fishing in the winter time. 
you can go to Paul's father's and all these spots that first ice and slam them. Well, three weeks later, they get, they get used to seeing things go up and down, up and down, up and down. It's, you know, they're not that stupid. If they were, they wouldn't be there year after year. You know? um, Mother Nature has a way of protecting itself. These bigger bodies of water, you know, the fish are aggressive because, you know, like Lake Ontario, it's the size of a freaking a state. There's more fish. They're they gotta they gotta eat to get big, and there's there's just more like a saltwater fishery. Whereas the smaller Adirondack lakes, you know, they have to somewhat be protected, or else they wouldn't be there. They'd all be gone. You know. You go out on Lake George. Once in a while, yeah. yeah, I love it out there. Yeah. Yeah. Probably go out there to be more interested in some of the big pike. Than yeah. Going out there for yep. Champlain, I love fishing. I think it's great. There's a lot of good fishermen up there. Yeah. Um, the challenge up there is, is it's big. So, I mean, I think the fish are more willing to bite. They're much better at telling you what they want up there. But uh, you, it's a little bit more like the Great Lakes in that the wind can move the fish around. Um, you know, it's deeper. You have there's a lot of different dynamics up there that make it tough. Yeah, but uh, like those pods of salmon, I mean, they could they could drift six miles one way or the other overnight with the wind or the bait or something, and so it's it's different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you start Champlain in March? Usually April. Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna be up there next year. Uh I only was up there for a few weeks. Uh probably I'm gonna try to stay there until maybe the second week in May. Next year. If you wanna come up, yeah. It's it's fun up there. A lot of fun. And it's just a good change, you know, just a good change of scenery. It's not too bad, especially during the week. Um, and that's another thing uh, on Lake George. I mean, that the boat traffic is definitely, if you try to go out and grind it out, like right now, the, the afternoon bite can be good at certain times of the year. But uh, there are days where the boat traffic, it's just punishing. And it. It's got to slow the fish down because there's 900 propellers buzzing around out there, you know. Yeah, it is. It's not. I mean, I, um, I tried to go out there. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. yeah. It is. Days like today are some of the worst days when it's calm because you're just you're just bobbing around, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the weeds have been pretty bad. I don't know if you guys have noticed that or not, but some days the weeds you can't even troll. It's they're so bad. Yeah. I mean, it, again, it depends. Like, I'm going to troll on the weeds. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I noticed the just from the boats, probably coming in and out of their slips. You know, oh. just chopping up the weeds yeah, that yeah, are there, yeah. and then they float around the lake until we get a good blow that. Sends them one way or the other, but that can be tough. With the heavy storms, you know, mm -hmm. clouds up everything. So now yep. there's a lot of heat in the water. So, but, yep. Right. Ah, it is. You got to go tomorrow? Yeah. If it doesn't, thunder and lightning. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty good. The weather's been just wacky. Yeah. How far back do you run from your ball? Spoons? Spoons, generally further than cowbells. Cowbells, you don't need to run them back very far. Um, spoons, 50, 50, sometimes 80, sometimes 100. And again, something that you can play with. Um, I don't run them back if I don't have to. But and that's another thing that's going to affect your release tension. You don't want to run them back too far because you're going to have more stretch the further you go. And then you're going to be dragging fish. Whereas if you run them tighter, you know, there's less resistance there. So the fish really going to break that release a lot easier. Um, it really depends on like, uh, 
the the attitude of the fish if they're spooking from your downrigger weights. Um, you know, I think they're very. They seem to. They really seem to be attracted to the weights. But I think in that sometimes it makes them cautious about the presentation when it comes through. Um, again, it's a seasonal thing too. Uh, when they're deeper, there's less visibility. So they can't see everything as good. In the springtime, you know, when you're fishing stick baits up in 10 feet of water, you know, then I'll run them back far because they just can see every, there's so much going to be so much more spooky of the boat and everything else. You know, it's water clarity. Um, now, like on Lake Champlain and Port Henry, you can't even net the fish until it's six inches underneath the surface of the water. You can't see them. It's so murky. So you don't have to run stuff back far. You know, that, that's just kind of a general rule of thumb is the clearer the water, the further back you go, you know. Sometimes on Ontario, the guys run flashers and flies and stuff. They want that leader from their dipsy diver as long as possible, and they'll pull it in by hand the rest of the way. So, you know, it's away from that dipsy diver. They just, they want the dive curve of the diver, but they don't want that fish to necessarily see it. So... Generally, uh, err on the side of caution when it comes to stuff like that. Um, your releases, like these releases, I, I'll always paint the tips of them with a black nail polish or markers. Anything, I want everything. I like stealth, personally, with everything. Everything black, small, dark. Um, because, A, uh, I don't want something that I'm going to have to, at the end of the day, it's going to become another variable. Like, oh, wow, I have one chartreuse release. I'm catching all the fish on this. Is it because the release is chartreuse? Probably not. It could be, though. But just one more thing I don't want to have to think about when I'm already thinking about depth, speed, how far back, what color, what lure, you know. So right from the get-go, releases, you know, all that stuff is simple. I've run all black downrigger weights. Um, I think I read it. Red's probably fine, you know. Oh yeah, lead's probably fine. I mean, some I've ran different colors. I've ran orange ones, and sometimes I did notice that the fish were more excited about the orange. But uh, I don't know. It's a lot of that stuff too. All we going back and forth with, and you know, it's really it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous because like scent. We get, were talking about scent the other day. Jeff just gave me the scent to try, and it looks pretty neat. And I'll try it. Uh, I really I don't think sun does much personally in in the trolling in the trolling uh, you know genre. I don't know. I've just I've tried it. I've had great days with it. I've had great days without it. I haven't used it in the past three weeks. Um, one thing it does do is it gets all over everything. If you leave it on your blades and your spoons, it it gets gunky and and it's you know it's just I don't know. Um, yeah, maybe, a, you know, jigging, if you have something that's right in front of their face, that's moving slowly. I can see it being useful, but, uh, I don't, it's just messy. And I don't know if you guys ever hear of, uh, Rick and Jackie from the Yankee Troller. He, uh, is a big charter captain out on Ontario, but he just, he likes to eat. He says, I just, I don't want it all over my hands, you know? And he's one of the top guys out there. He doesn't, doesn't use it. I don't know. But there's there's so many things that are a variable, and it really, you know, we've gone back and forth with, you know, are we running six-pound test mainline or eight or ten? You know, I, I'm running ten this year, and I don't think it's making much of a difference. Um, I think lighter is better, but it's there's a lot of things like that that is that are you going to catch a lot less fish because you're running eight pound test and somebody else is running six. I don't, probably not, you know, it's more of a mental thing, but the, the trolling is a game of confidence and you got to have a, a tool set for a variety of different conditions during different times of the year. And uh, that's really what it's all about. You know, in the springtime, if you're running the surface, you got to know how to use planer boards, what releases you're going to use, what spoon you're going to use or stick bait, uh, where you're going to go, where the fish are and that, changes all the time so that's kind of what's hard about it um 
this time of year, they, everything kind of settles into a pattern and it'll remain that pattern through pretty much October until everything ruptures and the fish get into their spawn mode and stuff like that. Yeah. About October. Yeah. I think I, like the middle of October, late October, when they start to go into pre-spawn, it, it gets a little tricky. Um, for what I do, I think that's a great time to get them other ways. You know, like a lot of the guys that jerk copper, that's their favorite time of year because they're all on the rocks. Um, but I don't know. I've done that too. You can do that. Oh, yeah. Jerk some copper. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's deadly. I mean, the guys that do it are really good. Um, but there are a lot of guys hand line them and they're using, they coil up copper and they use a bucket. So they'll bring the fish in and they'll coil their line up in a five gallon house. Yeah. But uh, I think it's kind of cool. I think it's a really cool technique, but uh, maybe kind of, you know. Not the most exciting way to bring a fish in, but they to each their own, you know. There's a guy, uh, uh, Mark. You ever see Mark Clemente out there? He's got a little blue rope. Uh, it's like a little 14 foot boat, and uh, he's he catches the heck out of them out there. Yeah. But those guys, they really there's a technique to that, and it takes a lot of skill to develop that because they they put a certain amount of line out, so their spoon is basically right on the bottom and it's it just picking a little bit of that clay up every once in a while and it's just a, it's just yeah, deadly you gotta start with but if you got too much line out you know you're dragging it if it's you have too less line out it's not in the strike zone and they don't they don't really like it as much so yeah, it's pretty cool yep <laughs> but uh Anyway, guys, uh, any any questions from the audience at home? Um, Kurt Rowling just says, hi, Joe. Kurt, uh, how you doing? Sue says, uh, what's that handsome fisherman? Or who's that handsome fisherman? <laughs> and uh, Dahl says, uh, Champlain fisherman struggling this year, so I appreciate the comments on my late great info. Thanks. Cool. Champlain guys, yeah, and that's what I mean there. I mean, in the springtime, it's probably the easiest time to fish up there. But once the, you get thermocline and temperature and wandering fish, it's a big lake up there. Um, yeah. So it's it's interesting the different struggles on these different fisheries come with learning lessons. You know, and I, I watch a lot of different seminars that they do on the Great Lakes because, you know, a lot of their challenges are finding fish. They, they could have king salmon that are 20 miles away and they're not accessible unless they, you know, burn a whole bunch of fuel to go get them. Or, you know, a lot of that is just having the fish around to catch. Same thing with Lake Champlain, you know. Or they have a, a bloom of uh, spining water fleas. You ever deal with those things? Oh, yeah. They get, get all of your line. We don't really have to deal with that on Lake George. Uh, right. Lake George is more, uh, the fish are there every day. It's just, they can be fussy to get them to bite, you know? So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. But they're doing better. Yeah, I've heard that too. I think they're doing a pretty good job up there. I mean they got a lot of lake trout, they got the walleye fishing's, you know, coming back somewhat. People are catching some salmon. I know. I would if I didn't live so far away. But that's a whole other ball of wax. I wouldn't. I'd, I'd have to really spend some time to figure them out up there. The walleye guys up there—they're not telling you nothing, you know. And I don't blame them. 
Yeah. That's cool. Nice. Well, thanks for coming in, guys. And, uh, yeah, you guys, you know, take a trip out someday. Get a, get a crew together. Yeah. You too. If you see me out there, give me a honk. Thank you. Yeah, man. Nice to meet you guys. I appreciate it. Thank you.